So uh, this is uh, beginning gardening. So gardening started with um, the extension service taking information that is given to farmers and then applying it to homeowners. So in the 50s, this is what they had. They had these long rows with all this space between the rows so you could drive your tractor through it. And you know every homeowner had a tractor. Not really, that's kind of being sarcastic. But that is the way the extension service presented it. And then uh, it took a while, and this is the traditional way of, of gardening. So you could, if you didn't have a tractor, then you could get your implements down the road. Well, what that did is it got perfect place for weeds to grow. So as a child, I was tortured, go out and weed. So this didn't really look, work well. So the things we want to do is encourage people to garden like this. So you have plants that are close together, things are organized. You can be as productive in a garden like this as you can in one of the more traditional 1950s gardens. So it's called square foot gardening. And it's all about the inches. And what started it, and we're going to show you some actual master gardener gardens. And the bed here on the left side is one, and this was actually planted in the no man's land that is between the sidewalk and the curb. So it's a four by four bed, and actually this master gardener was showing the entire neighborhood how to garden, and the neighborhood kids would come over and help her. Mm -hmm. So this all started with Mel Bartholomew, who was an engineer who wanted to garden and he was being frustrated. So he thought he'd take a local community class and as a result, the teacher never showed up, so he said, okay, I know a little bit. And he was um, retired, so basically he kind of organized things into a community garden. And he said, well, why are we planting in rows and there's all that bare soil? That's very efficient, inefficient. So as an engineer, he said, it's more efficient to, to do things square, and you can go up and you can go around and underneath. So he came up with the concept of planting things within a 12 inch space. And so his idea and concepts are plant densely, so each plant has exactly the amount of space it needs so that those two plants are exactly the right spacing so that they have room to grow, but they shade out any other plants, and therefore any other plants meaning weeds. So you, um, where plants need to go up, you train them to go up, whether it's on a fence or a support. You use a special um, soil mixture, he called it Mel's Mix, and not garden soil. Especially for us here in the valley, the garden soil is kind of deficit in certain nutrients. And it's hard, it needs a lot of uh, supplementation. Best thing to do is just go above it. Also, he says you don't have to have a whole, you don't have to have two feet of soil to grow in. You can do it in a shallow eight to twelve inch depth. Fertilizer isn't needed because you're going to use compost, and then keep the aisles between the boxes narrow. Be stingy with the seeds, and we'll talk about that. Uh, plant in squares and rotate your crops. So that pretty much is the principles of square foot gardening. So as a result of doing this, you're going to use a lot less space. You're going to use a lot less water. You're going to, it's not going to take you a lot of work to do it. You're going to use a lot less seeds to grow and no fertilizer. So a lot less with the inputs. So the return on your investment is really quite high. So the first thing you want to do is select the site. Now the site can be, it should be full sun, six to eight hours, preferably in the morning, with afternoon shade, especially for us here. No trees or shrubs that are close by, and I mean like if this is your garden bed here, like where I'm standing, that's not a good idea because I have a tree that's growing up into one of my garden beds now. So you kind of have to think about where things are. And then also have a water source because you don't want to be carrying buckets of water. So I'm going to give you examples of Master Gardener's garden, square foot gardening. So this is a site 
uh, she selected and you can see it's nice and sunny and then here is where she built the beds and we're going to talk about that so she had approximately a 23 by 20 foot square foot area so first off you build a box or something to retain your your growing mixture and you want it to be about 8 to 10 maybe 12 inches deep uh, it could be cement blocks uh, I'm going to show you cement corner blocks that can support two by fours or two by sixes. It could be made out of wood. It could be any available material that you have. So you might have something you want to recycle. Put a screen in the bottom to keep the gophers out. I deal with gophers and by screening it could be a quarter inch or uh, by quarter inch or it could be chicken wire. Maybe two layers. but. If you have a problem with gophers, do that. Um, also put down some sort of weed block. So here's some ideas for recycled materials. Okay, the this one here on that side right there on the uh, on your left, that's actually panels from a garage door that you can actually connect. And yes, it's a little deeper, but hey, it's recycled and it's free. How about a, a rowboat? There we go. There you go. How about a kiddie's wading pool? Local box store has them for $12. Cheap, there you go. It's not square, but hey, it works. Uh, this gentleman right here is weaving pieces of flexible willow or other branches in between little posts to make a barrier. So you can also even do it uh, make a tabletop garden with no problem. Okay, so try to make it Goldilocks. By that, if you've got your garden bed, you want to make sure that you can easily reach across it. Four feet deep if you're going to access it from both sides. No wider than um, two feet if you're going to do it from one side only. So and keep your walkways three feet or maybe a little bit wider. So then you can also modify it. So this doesn't have the boxes built, but it does have the same sort of concept. It's kind of a hybrid situation. So it has uh, the garden beds and it's just, it designates where to walk and where to plant. And these are built up beds that they're growing uh, plants in. Or you can make it really easy and take a bag of garden soil, cut the top out, put some holes in the bottom for drainage. Not the best option, but for short term, yes, you'd be growing. Just realize that by the end of the summer, all that plastic is going to deteriorate and it's just going to fall apart. Uh, five gallon buckets, depending on what you are planting, you might, if it's tomatoes, you might want to go to something larger. Uh, you can also have grow bags and you can, that are fabric pots and grow in there. Again, 10 gallons if you're planning on doing uh, tomatoes. Uh, you can also grow in various sort of containers. There's commercial ones that are vertical here. You have shoe storage containers. This right here is a gutter system or you can develop something else. So you kind of have to use your imagination. Now, I alluded to the fact that he did a Mel's mix. So Mel put up that uh, you can make a recipe and make your own growing material. And that would be a third compost by weight, a third peat moss, a third coarse vermiculite. And vermiculite looks like white styrofoam, but it's not styrofoam, it's a popped rock, very lightweight, and it kind of loosens up things. So you blend these three together, and this is a master gardener, we're going to show you how they blended it. So they just took it, they dumped it on a big blue tarp, and they just took it by the corner and they just mixed it. And then they took and they shoveled that into their garden bed area. Then the other thing that makes it a um, square foot garden is that you need to have a grid on top because the engineer said you need guidance. So his blueprint was to whether you use lath 
or you use mini blind slats, which is recycling, or even if you use string. And so you mark your growing areas out. So, and then you use either, she used pea gravel or you use shredded bark for the pathways. So now you're gonna plan your garden. So you need to have a plan on what you're gonna do. And this one's probably two and a half feet. These squares are, are a little bit bigger than 12 inches, just so you know. But you want to plant in there according to the spacing. And here's some examples of spacing. So Mel took the idea that you can have common spacing for certain um, vegetables. So he said that a, you could have one tomato that would grow in one 12 inch space. And because it's going to grow vertical and you're going to train it up, 12 inches would be enough. Another thing was you could grow four corn plants in 12 inch space. Now for corn, you have to have at least four rows. So you're going to grow at least two 12 inch blocks. So you have the proper pollination. You can have a pepper in 12 inches, uh, carrots, what is that, 16 per 12 inches, and so on. Best thing to do is when you, when you are planting things, take a look at the back of the seed packet. It will tell you the spacing. Okay, and then the other thing is to grow vertically. So these are cattle panels that are attached to uh, steel T-posts, and then uh, that supports, and this is to grow things vertically, beans and also tomatoes. And these garden beds are about two feet wide. So pretty much I'm growing, and this is my garden by the way, some of my beds. So I'm growing on two sides. And then you can take these cattle panels, which are 16 feet long, and actually make an arch. So I'm gonna grow cucumbers up, and they're gonna grow up and over. So that's the way. And then when I'm talking about concrete blocks, these are the concrete blocks here and then you can actually just slip the board in between in the slot. Very easy, very simple way to, to make a bed. Okay, so success in vegetable gardening. Plant as large a garden as you can maintain. Don't go out and plant, uh, let's say, okra if no one in your family eats okra. So also think about what you like and what you're going to eat. So plant seasonally, plant repeatedly. So plant green beans, let's say every three weeks, you're going to make a new planting. So that way you have a continual harvest of green beans. Okay. Or if you're going to take and uh, do zucchini plants and plant two zucchini plants at a time. There is no reason to go mm -hmm. beyond two. And this is what the extension service says for a family of four. Two zucchini plants at a time is sufficient. So they even have a whole page, and I can show you in the here in the Master Gardener Handbook, this nice document about California gardening. This was our handbook that we studied. This is available for purchase from the Extension Service. It tells you all about anything you want to plant. But they have broken down how many plants are needed for a family of four to make sure you don't overplant. And it kind of gives you a range. So 10 to 20 tomatoes, depending on what you're gonna do and if you're gonna do, uh, let's say, preservation. So um, prepare and amend your soil. So that was the thing that Mel said, is when you plant and when, and let's say you're gonna harvest and you're done with this plant, take it away, put mulch in, uh, compost in the hole, do a little stir and replant immediately. That way you keep things going and you get putting in compost, which is exactly what Mother Nature said. So, grow high value foods. So, being an engineer, Mel sat down and said, these are the ones you spend the most money on at the store. So he said, herbs. You can spend a lot of money with herbs. Herbs are easy to grow. Uh, so for us here in the valley, you can uh, plant thyme, rosemary, oregano, sage. Those are perennials. 
they will they will grow without too much uh, bother. Basil likes it hot. They like it in the summer. Uh, dill likes it a little cool. Uh, cilantro likes it cool on the cool side. So if anyone says, "Oh man, I really want to make fresh salsa. I want I want to grow. You know, when you have tomatoes, you need to have cilantro." Cilantro doesn't like it at the same temperature that tomatoes like. So that could be something you just have to buy at the grocery store. So it likes it about 85 degrees to about 50, to give you an idea. So it's not compatible with tomatoes. Okay, so Mel said another thing was uh, parsnips, if you like them. Those are high value. Cherry tomatoes, sun gold, if you can find them, are good cherry tomato garlic, heirloom tomatoes, and we'll talk about tomatoes later, uh, turnips, leeks, winter squash, hybrid tomatoes, and spinach. These all make good, I, good things to plant appropriately. The, the bottom vegetables for value that Mel said, you can get them cheaper at the store than your effort to grow them. So take a look at the list here. Potatoes are is cheaper at the store a Brussels sprout I have never been able to grow. Uh, bell peppers, very easy to grow. They're cheap at the store. It's up to you, you know. Peppers in general, if you have a specialty pepper, yes, definitely grow it. Swiss chard, everybody know what Swiss chard is? Okay, he doesn't. Okay. Here's a Swiss chard. It's a leafy vegetable. Okay, this one is a red stemmed ruby one. It also comes large, flat, white rib. I know it's at the store. You usually prepare it. You prepare the the, the greens primarily. It's it's a really nice plant during the summer, and it will it'll grow in the summer. It actually likes it cool. Swiss chard can kind of go year round. Sometimes it doesn't look too pretty, but anyway. I like Swiss chard, it's beautiful. I love cooking with it. I yeah. love cooking, little lemon on it. Absolutely. Yes, little lemon. See, we, we can exchange <laughs> recipes. Okay, whatever you do, plant some flowers for the beauty and plant some for the pollinators. So it actually makes sense in your vegetable garden to put flowers in. So plant some marigolds, some zinnias, and some others. Okay, so you're ready to plant. So here's an example, you know, you want to have your irrigation system set up, and with irrigation, a hand watering situation, it fulfills you as a person being out there and hand watering, I can guarantee it will not be an even irrigation system. So think about what else you can put in. So put a fork or a trowel in it. Once you've got the square foot gardening set up, a, a fork is pretty much all you need to, uh, to weed with. And even then, if you go out and spend a few hours in your garden, you'll just spend minutes getting rid of the weeds. So harvest, replant, you've got about 300 plus, actually 365 days that you can grow here in the valley. So you can grow something. Uh, the last average frost for Visalia was approximately February 3rd, except for this year. I would think the last frost we had was, what, end of March? mid-March, that was so extremely, uh, well, not 2023 is going to be the year. Okay, so, and remember to put a scoop of compost in the growing hole and replant short plants in the front, taller ones in the back, and grow vertically. So, let's talk about mulch and adding organic matter. So, nature adds organic matter naturally. Leaves fall, branches fall down, things decompose over, over time. What do we do as gardeners? We go out, we rake the leaves. We haul them away. So we make sure that organic matter is not added and not added like nature intended. So
So it's up to us to add the composted leaves and branches back in. Uh, so compost could be the leaves, it could be the branches, it's aged manure, not fresh, even though we're surrounded by dairy farms, you can get aged manure, worm castings, uh, organically you have blood meal, bone meal that's available. So every, every garden can now look like this. I'm being sarcastic again, gentlemen. So it's, you, we want beauty and whether your beauty and my beauty could be two different things. So grow herbs, grow flowers, grow food for every day. And think about, do I want to grow food to preserve, to freeze, to can dehydrate? So what can you plant this time of year? So here we are at the beginning of May. You can definitely plant basil. You have choices. You can even do uh, different types of basil. You don't have to cook with it. You can let it go to flower. It's a, it attracts bees. Beans. You've got beans, pole beans versus bush beans. Uh, corn, cucumber, eggplants can be transplanted, melons, okra, peppers, sweet potatoes, the squash, the summer squash, and the winter squash. So what's the difference between a summer squash and a winter squash? Anybody know? Color? It could be color. It's uh, mainly to do with the storage of it. So. A, a summer squash is a zucchini. It grows fast, takes about 50 days, maybe less, and it's it has a very tender skin to it. Versus a hard squash would be a pumpkin. Um, a butternut type squash, we'll get into my butternut uh, nightmare. <laughs> yeah. So, and so they usually have 120 plus days on a winter squash to get to maturity. So, and of course then you've got tomatoes. So, let's say NPK, and it's all about the numbers on this. So, when you're um, looking at fertilizer, and if you're using mulch, you shouldn't have to worry about fertilizer. Some people might, and there's a few cases where you might want to give a little extra boost. So I've actually brought an example of my compost pile right here. And if you open it up, you can see there's onion peel, there's a rind, but pretty much it's broken down. And it looks like it's, it's in really good shape. So this is what I will use to put in back onto the soil. I'll use this as a mulch meaning I will put it on top and I'll have my irrigation uh, oozy hoses underneath and I'll put this on top and kind of keep the moisture in. And I'll also use this to mend the garden. Now, the other thing, if you don't want to do Mel's Mix, you can actually get potting soil and use that instead. So here's example, and you can pass this around. This is two different types of potting soil one that has, and they both have a certain amount of fertilizer in there, but if you just look at the, com uh, at the composition, one has a lot of forest products in it, the other one, it's finely ground. So obviously the one with the forest products in, it's gonna take a longer to kind of break down some of those shavings, and it's not quite ready. Now, so, your numbers here, NPK, it's the first number is nitrogen, and that usually encourages the production of leaves. The second number is phosphorus. So phosphorus encourages root growth, it encourages flowers. Flowers means fruit. So that's middle number. We kind of like to have a middle number there. And then potassium is the last number, and that's for overall vigor and promotes disease resistance. Now, if you look, I have three examples up there, three sets of numbers. The first one is for miracle growth. Now, the 18, okay, here's one, the nitrogen's at a four. Here it's the top one, it's at 18, four here, six here at the bottom. So miracle Grow is a product 
that promotes itself as being your, your be all end all for nutrient needs. And what will happen if you put that on tomatoes is tomatoes don't really need a lot of nitrogen. They need it once when you plant it, just to kind of help the leaves go, right? Nitrogen leaves. But if you continue to add nitrogen, what's going to happen to your tomato? It's going to go crazy with leaves. Is it, how is it going to go with but it's going to grow leaves rather than too much fruit, even though it's got a large number there in phosphorus and a large one in potassium. So yes, it will be extremely healthy, but it will grow a lot of leaves. So you kind of have to look and would probably one of these other two might be more appropriate at a more natural, the way nature intended it. So this is just a real high view of fertilizers. Anyone have questions? No. Okay. Uh, I do have a yeah, uh, go. compost. So, ideally, that you know stuff you're just kind of like waste already. That you're just kind right. Of okay. So we'll get into my chickens. My chickens go are free range. They go out to the compost pile. They go out. They scratch around. They eat whatever they wish. They think it's great. And so, yes, this it continually breaks down there, and you continue to add moisture to help these things naturally decompose. Okay, yeah, so like, we have a compost bin, but we have no idea how to use it, so we're just Okay, curious. so to do compost, there's almost like a whole nother, I won't say it's, it's complex, but you need to start out with volume and the volume could be three feet by three feet by three feet high with layers of browns and greens meaning dried product and that could be uh, paper shred okay. i think you might know someone that might have paper shred um, leaves would be brown um, older coffee grounds can be considered to be brown if they are like uh, 48 hours after you've used, you know, after they've been used. Right. If it is new coffee grounds, that let's say same day that they are, you've made coffee with, those are considered greens and actually high in nitrogen. Who knew? So you have coffee that can go both ways. So stop by Starbucks, say, hey, if can I have your bucket of coffee grounds? You could add that into your compost. Okay. So you can talk to people that are raking leaves. Hi, if you want to, you know, bag it up, I'll pick it up for free. Take it, throw it on, I mean, just scatter leaves anywhere. Okay. Um, a, a tree trimming service that's in the area. Ask them, okay, the, the bark, the things that you're shredding there, anything too dangerous in there? Oh, it's not, great. Would you like to dump these at my house? And they will, they'll be, oh great, that saves us money. You're right here, would love to dump. So mm -hmm. we've actually gotten five loads of bark that way. And then you just, then you can spread it, you can add it, put it back in. So yeah, to do a, a compost pile, you need to have some, and then you have to add moisture. So it all breaks down. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there is a lot to doing compost, or you can do it the slick, easy way. Dig a hole in the ground, bury it. Boom, there it is. Let nature take care of itself. And you can do trench composting that way where you just dig a trench. Okay. Easy peasy. And so you, what you want are food scraps in there, uh, you do not want meat, you do not want bones, you do not want oils or fats at a high level. Yeah. So, and, y and I'll give, uh, you can contact the Extension Office, the Master Gardeners, they have handouts on how to do composting. Okay. They kind of help you with guidelines. Thank you. Oh, sure. Okay, seeds. So, seeds, um, I'm going to pick on tomatoes here. So heirloom seeds versus an F1 or a hybrid seed. So I think people have the opinion that heirlooms are where it's all at. You should only plant heirloom seeds. 
heirlooms are seeds or, or that have been out there for 50 to 75 years. Your grandmother planted them. They have great taste. So this is why you should plant them versus a hybrid. Hybrid sounds like, oh, it could be something that came, comes out of the laboratory. So actually what it, if so there's, I, I plant a combination of both. I have some heirlooms. I know the heirlooms will taste great. They'd probably be a little slower to produce. Um, they may not have a disease resistance compared to a hybrid. All the hybrid is, is there was a mommy, there was a daddy, they had children. I'm planting the children. If I save the seed from the children, those children could either be like mommy or they could be like daddy. They will not be like the parent or the child there. So it's not an established seed production that you should save. But to, to plant a hybrid, it's a benefit because it could have disease resistance or it could have production. And if, you know, I try to plant things that, that have great uh, taste associated with it. So my beans, I plant hybrids. My tomatoes, I plant some heirlooms and I plant a lot of hybrids because I want to do preservation. I want the production. So in tomatoes especially, you have either a determinate type of tomato or an indeterminate. So like it name says, there it, it, it is determined to produce the fruit at a certain time. So it's a Roma tomato. It's going to produce the uh, fruit between a four to six month, a uh, four to six week period for production. So that's why you plant it because you know I'm going to process those. Farmers will plant those because they're going to make tomato sauce or whatever. Indeterminate, they're, as long as the plant is happy and it's the right temperature, they will continue to produce, produce tomatoes until it freezes the plant. So you could have a Roma, certain set production versus a San Marzano, another processing type of tomato that is going to produce fruit over a long period of time. An indeterminate will it plant will continue to grow and grow and grow and grow until it freezes. So those are the plants that grow to 12 feet or 16 feet and want to cover your house or the neighborhood. Determinants grow much shorter and very contained. GMO seeds are something that home gardeners don't have to worry about. Those are not out there in release to home gardeners. Those are mainly there for production farming. So, any questions about seeds? Indeterminate heirloom, good. Uh, any, how do you get the seeds, I guess, from like something that's already... Fruit? Okay, so there's various, <coughs> so let's take uh, green beans. Sure. Green beans, you know, they have the pod, you let the pod dry on the plant until it rattles. Now you can take the seeds. It could either be the dry seeds like pinto beans or black beans. Those are the same things. Those actually you can replant. Okay. Um, other things like such as tomatoes, you can squeeze the seeds out that you see in that little gel and you actually have to ferment those for a couple days before you can strain them out and then dry them. So there's a whole... Every plant's different. Yeah, every okay. plant's a little bit different. All right. Okay, so for tomatoes, the Extension Service has determined that for a family of four, 10 to 20 plants will be sufficient. So there's all kinds of different, uh, different tomatoes. You could have a cherry. Usually they come into production faster than say a large heirloom or a beefsteak or a slicer. Uh, the newest thing out there is a midget or a dwarf or a patio tomato. Um, then you have a standard tomato, which would be the ones you see, um, nice round ones you see at the grocery store versus a salad tomato, which are the ones you see maybe in like January, little round ones, a little bit smaller than a tennis ball. And then you get to the big beefsteak ones, 
that are a pound, pound and a half, two pounds. Okay, so here's an example of a dwarf tomato. Got something new added. So you can see, here's, uh, see how tall it is. It's gonna go about three feet tall, three, four feet. Be very contained. Fruits very close together. Stem is usually very thick. And I don't know if you can see on the back of this, there's a trellis up there, supports here for like a 12 foot high standard sort of tomato. So, okay, so back up. So if you're currently going to one of the big box stores to get tomato plants, a lot of the things I noticed this year, they have these dwarf and patio tomatoes available. They're out there, they have, they are just a, they've been uh, grown out and they're modified and they're some of the same name brand tomatoes that you'd see. Now here's some tomato problems you might have seen. You seen this down here on the bottom of some big tomatoes? Those are called cat facing and it's a lack of calcium and a watering problem. Okay. You can have sunburn. I guess you didn't know tomatoes could get sunburn. That's sun skull. Cracking from too much water at one time. Whether it's rainfall or your irrigation uh, got loose and you got too much water, the skin's cracked because the tomatoes grew too fast. Uh, loss of end rot right here. It's a leathery portion on the bottom of tomatoes. You can just cut it off. And what it is, it is a lack of, of calcium going into the fruit. And it's basically because of water trans, uh, transportation system from the roots up to the fruit. So yes, it's a lack of calcium, but specifically tied to water movement through the plant. And then you can also have leaf curl and that you can have in a lot of different plants and that's because it got too hot and the plants trying to protect themselves from water loss. So that's this. Okay, and then tomato hornworms. Anybody seen this lovely on their plants? Mm -hmm. I've seen them before, yeah. Yes, okay, when you find them, you just pick them off, put them on the ground and you can do the twist over them, stomp them, put them in a, mm -hmm. a pail of water, Yes, if they're very, they're, they like to hide out. Now, companion planting. So here's basil, my favorite thing. So you can do sweet basil, lime, lemon, cinnamon, purple, Thai. This is something that you can cook with or you can just let it go to flower. If you let it, if you let your good Genovese basil go to flower, then pretty much you should not be picking the leaves you won't have the taste. So you want to continue to pinch out those flower spikes on the ones that you want to um, save the leaves with. And okay, so companion planting for certain things. So kind of think when you're cooking with it, would it taste good with that other vegetable? If it would taste good, then it's probably a good companion. Oh, who knew? Accessible. Yes. Make it easy. Time. Take the time. Plant some time. So you can have culinary time or you can have decorative time. Very pretty. You can actually walk on it. Oregano. Easy. Last year round. Okay, cilantro. And this is where I said it best growing conditions are 50 to 85 degree, which is a real bummer in the summer. But you can always try planting it. It's a great uh, plant for pollinators when it goes to flower. So you can have cilantro leaves or you can grow it out and have it turn into uh, coriander. So it's all the same plant. Okay, squash. So extension service said, oh, only plant two to four vines for summer and winter squash. So you don't have to go crazy. Remember Mel Bartholomew plant limited things like a package of carrot seeds. That's 1500 seeds in a packet. So you do not want, you will not eat 1500 carrots when they become mature all at once. So think about it. 
55 days to maturity for a zucchini or a summer squash versus 120 plus on a pumpkin and a butternut. Okay, squash pests. Here's the biggie, uh, squash beetle. Hard, nothing you can really do to spray it. Probably the easiest thing to do is put a, um, a piece of wood underneath the plant, allow the bugs to run under at night, come in the next morning and try to capture as many as you can as they're running away. Get a handheld vacuum. Vacuum them up. That was not an extension <laughs> recommendation. That's a Shelly recommendation. Uh, you also have grubs there. Okay, beans. Okay, extension service says 60 to 100 plants for a family of four, depending on what you're going to do. Bush beans, a little bit more productive over a short period of time. Whole beans need support, so they will produce over a long period of time. So it kind of depends. What do you want? Yard long beans, they love the heat. So, and these are also called asparagus beans. You actually might have some seeds out there in the seed library. They're, uh, they are, they're, they're very good. Okay, pests for beans. Aphids. Aphids live under on the bottom side of the leaves. So, and they, they will suck out the sap and as a result, they, they will also spread diseases because they're just, you know, they have their little straws and their suffates, you know, sucking things out. Uh, ants love aphids because aphids give off, uh, excrete a liquid called honeydew, which is actually aphid poop. And ants are drawn to it and they will actually milk the aphids to get it. So, things that help control aphids are ladybugs. Excuse me, this is actually a Mexican bean beetle. Looks like a ladybug, but ladybugs are very beneficial because they will eat the aphids. So to get rid of aphids, you just take your fingers, two things, you can use a mild soap water and spray it, but you have to spray the bottom of the leaves to get to the aphids or you can take your fingers and run them across the bottom and actually just squish them. Anybody here have a queasy stomach about squishing? Yeah, come on guys, we yeah. just. I mean, I had, I had worms in my garden and I was just pulling them off and just squishing them with my hands. That's right, get down. the satisfaction that <laughs> you've got them. <laughs> you are the predator, <laughs> yes. Okay, spider mites. So this is, a, if you see them at this stage, it might be a little too late, but you can go out and try to get the soapy water, the sprain with water. They're attracted to hot, dusty conditions, which always happens about July or August. And they are, they come in again, they're another sucking insect. And so you need to get rid of those. So peppers, five to 10 plants, for family. I have 20, 30 now, so of various types. So I guess we're going to be making cowboy candy, uh, all sorts of different uh, salsas. So Scoville units, I put this up kind of interesting. The heat, and how do you, de do, how do you determine a Scoville unit? You get professional taste testers out there, and you have them taste um, pepper juice in water, and then you see how many times you need to dilute that down before the professional taste testers cannot taste it anymore. So for a, a, a bell pepper, that's about a zero. Okay, let's go up here to uh, Trinidad Scorpion at, three, at two million. So they had to take that water with the pepper juice in it and dilute it two million times before they could not taste it. So that was the Scoville unit for that pepper. So yes, so there's all kinds of peppers. Peppers like to be in the shade 
by the way. They are traditionally grown as understory plants in South America. So, okay, growing peppers. Peppers kind of like a lot of compost. They like some nitrogen. Um, so here's those numbers. 5105, they want the they want more phosphorus there for the fruit and for overall health. So you can have, so this could be something that you want to go, maybe put a, some of those fresh coffee grounds around the base every week, because if you use fresh coffee grounds, they're high in nitrogen. And they're also kind of help the soil. So here you can have aphids again, our friendly aphids really like tender leaves. You can have some weevils that might uh, burrow into the fruit, or you can have a virus. Okay, and then they can also have a calcium deficiency, again, due to water. Okay, here's some of my pests, and I throw this in as a joke. So, here's my chicken. My chicken can decimate a garden with buddies in one day and strip all the leaves. So, and then aphids are another big one. So, to keep pests out of the garden, you can put uh, PVC hoops. And there's, it's hard to see, but there's actually netting on there that keeps the chickens out. So that's the only way I can have kale and chard is to have netting up. Okay? So here's here's my tale of woe and why you should only, <laughs> Jonathan's already laughing, why you should only plant what you think you're going to use. So I planted cucumber seeds. And I could have sworn those, those are the cucumber seeds. They're growing right here next to the dill. And then pretty soon they got bigger and they got bigger and they started to grow and they started to go over. They weren't cucumber seeds, by the way. They were butternut squash. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I had butternut squash and I had butternut squash and I had butternut squash, and for what those pictures are, I left that many in the garden to rot. Okay, so this is why you only want two to four vines on the squash. So anyway, recap real quick on square foot gardening. Build a frame, fill it with mills mix or a real good potting soil with compost, um, make a grid, plant according to the directions, uh, and spacing so you eliminate the weeds, grow things vertically, water deeply, use your soil probe and your moisture probe to figure out how wet things are, harvest, enjoy, and then replant with a scoop of compost. And then uh, rotate your plants around. So, so we're going to talk about these things and 